Okay, thank you, Ray. So I'll just start with a brief introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I lead the marketing science group for Ipsos Marketing in the US, and I'm also a social psychologist by training. So in today's digital world, there is a ton of data that is available to us for understanding consumers better in terms of what they want from products or services. So the online product reviews, it tells what consumers are happy with and what they're not happy with and what is important to them. We have websites like Yelp, TripAdvisor, and Amazon. And if given consumers a platform to share their feedback, a rich source of data that is available to us for understanding brand and products within a more social context. Simply put, there is no shortage of data. Likewise, just as there are many new emerging data sources for us to work with, there are also many emerging analytical approaches. It seems like there is a new analytic approach every few months. Terms like you know, machine learning, natural language processing, sentiment analysis, neural networks, random forest, deep learning, the list seems endless. But analytical tools are just tools, and unless we have a purpose and know what we want to build, we don't know what tools we should use, nor what to build with them. So in short, huge amounts of data and sophisticated analytical tools by themselves are not guarantees that we're going to get the insights we need. Without knowing what we are looking for or having a framework to guide our analysis, it's like having a bunch of building materials and many tools, but not knowing what exactly we're building. And this is the subject of today's presentation. We believe that behavior economics provides a framework that can guide analysis and the interpretation of big data. This is particularly so if the big data we're looking at is generated by people. At a very fundamental level, behavior economics is about understanding human cognition and behavior. I'd like to share with you today an illustration of how we can use behavior economics to guide analysis and interpretation of big data. Now the flow of this presentation will be as shown here. I'll start by first talking about the data we're using. I'll then use two key findings or areas in behavior economics to illustrate how we can use behavior economics to guide our analysis and interpretation. The first is a robust finding that has been well documented in psychology. This is the negativity bias. Okay? Essentially, it is the finding that negative information has more impact on us than positive information. The second is that our behavior and thinking is often influenced by our emotions. Why these two areas of behavior economics? Well, I selected these two as they are both psychological effects that govern all aspects of our lives and perhaps more importantly, are often ignored in traditional market research. So let's talk about the data we use for this presentation. Now we extracted approximately 7,000 online reviews on cars off of a car review site and these online reviews came from six English speaking countries. While we had reviews for countries beyond these six, we went with these six as these countries had the most reviews. The reviews were all text analyzed. But before we share the findings from this specific project, however, I'll take you through a brief explanation of what negativity bias is. So what do we mean by negativity bias? Negativity bias means that we're more likely to pay attention to negative input than to positive input. This is a tendency to give more weight to negative input. And this tendency to give more weight to negative input likely evolved for a good reason, to keep us out of harm's way. Now from the dawn of human history, our very survival has depended on our skill at avoiding danger. In short, a human brain was wired to notice danger so that we hopefully would respond to that danger. Let me give you two intuitive examples in our daily life to illustrate this negativity bias. Now, we're nearing the end of the year, and for many of us, this means it's almost time for the dreaded annual review. Did you ever figure out why we dread the annual review? Well, here's one reason I think why it is dreaded. So imagine you were reviewed on six factors and or dimensions and this was the outcome. So you were positive on five of them and negative on one of the factor. What do you think you will end up focusing on and stewing over for the next week or so? I think for most of us it would be the one negative. If you think about this for a moment, that just does not sound very rational. 
why would we focus on the one negative when clearly there are five positives? Well, that's because we have a negative bias. Focusing on the negative ensures our survival. Perhaps literally, if that one negative could be the justification for a company to get rid of us. Probably not, but hey, that's what ensures our survival, being vigilant for such threats. Okay, let's move on to a second example that also impacts most of us. We see a ratio here of 5 to 1. 5 to 1 is the ratio of positive to negative interaction it takes for marriage to survive. Researchers have found that as long as there were five times as much positive feeling and interaction between husband and wife as there are negative, a marriage was more likely to be stable over time. In contrast, couples who were heading for divorce had far too little on the positive side to compensate for the growing negative between them. So if you're married or in a relationship, take note of this ratio and make sure that you ramp up the positive events. All right, so I've given you a sense of what the negatively bias is. So let's now talk about the car review data and the results from our analysis of the car reviews in that context. Knowing that the human mind is impacted by negativity bias means that even before we get into any data analysis of our car review data, we knew going in that we wanted to look at positive and negative reviews separately and quantify the relative impact. So here we share a sample of key positive and negative reviews. It's noteworthy that even though there were overall more positive comments than negative, there's still quite a bit of negative comments or reviews. This is the advantage of using product reviews online. As opposed to surveys, where we often only ask positive attributes, product reviews allow us to capture negative comments. And these negative comments are important because of the negativity bias we have. I'll show you how we quantify the impact of the negativity bias on the next slide. And to do so, we'll focus on two themes that are common across both positive and negative reviews. These are electronics and reliability. So when a theme was present in both positive and negative form, like in this case for electronics and reliability, negative reviews had a larger impact than positive reviews on consumers' overall car rating. Now the numbers you see on the slide are no longer percentages, but they are indices that show you the relative impact of each theme on the overall car rating. Now for our purpose, you can think of there being a positive impact index that goes from 1 to 100, and a corresponding negative index that goes from negative 1 to negative 100. From the results, you can see that while positive reviews on electronics had an impact of plus 38, negative reviews on electronics had an impact of negative 47. In other words, good electronic delight consumers, but bad electronics annoy consumers to a greater extent. And we see the same for reliability. While reliable had an impact of plus 48, unreliable had an impact of negative 79. So reliability pleases, but unreliability makes us just downright mad. Now these findings are consistent with the negativity bias, that negative events have a larger impact than positive events. Evolutionarily, our brains are hardwired to pay attention to negative events. This ensures our survival. Okay, now that we've seen the negativity bias manifest itself online, let's turn our attention to the second topic of emotions. Emotions, though often viewed as touchy-feely, is often what we use to make decisions. Behavior economics tells us that we often make our decision based on how we feel or perhaps want to feel. So even though we're dealing with big data, this does not mean that it is devoid of emotion. To the contrary, when it comes to cars, it is likely full of emotion. We purchase cars that reflect who we aspire to be and that express our values. Now, online reviews of cars tend to provide more than feedback on functional qualities. They also give us a way to understand the deep emotional connection that consumers have with their cars. So how do we use behavior economics to analyze and interpret big data? We know from behavior science in general that people often have different emotions or motivations that they seek. 
very generally speaking, for example, many of us want to look good to others. We want to enjoy ourselves. We want to feel part of a group. We want to feel in control. Some academic research make the case that some of these motivations and emotions are universal. At Ipsos, we have such an emotional framework. So this emotional framework was used to guide our analysis and interpretation of the car reviews. Now, using this framework as a lexicon, we coded the reviews from consumers into eight emotions. Okay? The eight emotions are shown here along with the specific feedback used to define each emotion. For example, if we found any verbatim that was along the line of liking how the car drives, we would classify the review into the emotion of vitality. The review could be coded into more than one emotion. This is, of course, is just one example of an emotional framework. Other emotional frameworks can, of course, be used to analyze big data. We chose this one simply because this is what we use at Ipsos. Now, we applied this framework to four car brands, Lexus, BMW, Mazda, and Honda. We'll take a look at the two luxury car brands, Lexus and BMW, first. Now, on the surface, Lexus and BMW seem similar. Both are considered expensive luxury cars. Now, when we use our emotional framework, however, it allows us to see the nuances of the two brands. So even though they share the power in motion, the Lexus brand is higher on recognition, okay, as captured by mentions of uh, beautiful, luxurious, whereas BMW is higher on vitality, which is as captured by mentions, of, uh, mentions on the excitement of the drive. Now, these findings reflect Lexus and BMW's positioning conveyed by past marketing campaigns. So you may remember, for example, the marketing campaign, the pursuit of perfection for Lexus, and the marketing campaign, the ultimate driving machine for BMW. Now, turning to the two more mainstream car models, we see that Mazda shares the vitality emotion with BMW. The master focus on the driving experience via its zoom zoom and driving matters marketing campaigns appear to have been successful in bringing this message home. So while master clearly lacks the power and recognition of BMW, it has succeeded at positioning itself on vitality, okay, which is about the driving experience. For Honda, we see that it stands out primarily on control, but also on belonging, security, and conviviality. Now, the reliability of Honda cars as captured by control, together with the more socially oriented emotions, appear to be of greater importance among its purchasers. And the more socially oriented emotions are likely important to families who buy Honda cars. As a last look, we place the results for all four brands on this one slide. You can see that by using this emotional framework, it helps us distinguish the four car brands in terms of the emotion experience with each car brand. In summary, there is a ton of data and analytical tools available to us. Right? But data is just data and tools are just tools. What we ultimately want is a story that helps explain our findings. And we can build such a story when we use behavioral economics as a framework. Now, the goals for a data mining project should not be broad and general. For example, we often hear objectives like gaining insights into customer behavior, discover meaningful patterns, or find something interesting. While these are all worthy goals, they are too broad. Using the findings from behavioral economics helps us to narrow down what we're looking for, to interpret the results we get, and also to provide guidance on how we should act to more effectively market. Today, we've illustrated how this can be done using two broad topics in behavioral economics, a negativity bias and the role of emotions. There is some of course, a lot more to behavioral economics than these two that we have chosen to highlight. The key point that is, is that if we want to understand consumer behavior, we can leverage behavioral economics, or more broadly, behavioral science to guide our analysis, the interpretation, and also the rec recommended course of action. And with that, I, I thank you.